Send out your light and your truth that they may lead me and bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Lord, open our lips. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Hallelujah.
reading from the book of Numbers. So the Lord said to Moses, gather for me 70 of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tent of meeting and have them take their place there with you. I will come down and talk with you there and I will take some of the spirit that is on you and put it on them. And they shall bear the burden of the people along with you, so that you will not bear it all by yourself. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. And he gathered 70 elders of the people and placed them all around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. Two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, son of Nun, the assistant of Moses, one of his chosen men said, my Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. The word of the Lord. reading from the Gospel according to John. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know. So the disciples said to one another, surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say, four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Day by day we bless you. We praise your name forever. Lord, keep us from all sin today. Have mercy on us, Lord, have mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy. For we put our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope. And we shall never hope in vain. Almighty and merciful God, in your goodness keep us, we pray, from all things that may hurt us that we, being ready both in mind and body, may accomplish with free hearts those things which belong to your purpose. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, Receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. O oh God, you have committed to your servants the ministry of reconciliation, and you have guided our forebears to found the Virginia Theological Seminary. Watch over us, we pray you, in the years to come as you have guided us in the past. Keep our leaders alert to the voice of your spirit, that we cling only to such things as are good in the past and press forward with courage to the new service of the future. Grant our teachers to, grant to teachers and students humility to learn, wisdom to plan, courage to follow where your truth may lead, and love to think of others before self. So dwell in our homes that we may reflect the spirit of the Father for whom every family is named. Bind us all into an holy fellowship. Make all our worship, work, and play witness faithfully to you, so that the seminary may be a center from which light and life and love shall radiate to the four corners of the earth through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we say together, accept, O Lord, our thanks and praise for all that you have done for us. We thank you for the splendor of all creation, the beauty of this world, for the wonder of life, and its ministry of love. We thank you for the blessing of family and friends, and for the loving care that surrounds us on every side. We thank you for setting us the task of demand. We thank you also for those disappointments and 
Glory to God, whose power, working in us, can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to him from generation to generation in the church, and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Amen. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this commencement of Virginia Theological Seminary. I want to give a special welcome to those who've joined us on our live stream from our website. It is now common for us to have more people viewing the stream than in the hall, and we're especially pleased that you're with us now. I want to express our gratitude to the generosity and hospitality of Episcopal High School uh, which is especially some significant today as we will be having the opportunity to honour the head of this school. Episcopal High School has been an exceptionally good neighbour to Virginia Theological Seminary, 
especially since 2010 when we lost our chapel fire. And finally, I do wish to just recognize that uh, all our graduates are in the Washington Post on page two. It's a prime slot. <laughs> We're really pleased about that. Uh, and it's lovely for us to have all our graduates in a premier national newspaper uh, for a good news story. And let's try and keep it like that going forward. <laughs> As I was standing here, it's, it's always a little frightening standing here because you're very conscious of the fact that you're singing and you sort of fear that people sitting at home are having the ghastly experience of having to listen to my voice sing all those hymns. Uh, but uh, it did remind me of the last time actually I stood here and that was when Barbara Brown Taylor was with us and she was exploring the theme of darkness and how we should embrace the darkness which was figured so prominently in Time magazine. And so therefore, it really is a thrill to have back to Virginia Theological Seminary the Reverend Dr. Barbara Brown Taylor as our commencement speaker. She is a renowned author. She's written 12 books, including the New York Times bestseller, An Altar in the World. She's an extraordinary teacher. Uh, and she's been a groundbreaking preacher and pastor since her ordination in the Diocese of Atlanta in 1984. Dr. Taylor earned her Master of Divinity degree from Yale Divinity School and has been awarded the Honorary Doctorate in Divinity degree by eight seminaries and, one uni and universities, one being Virginia Theological Seminary. So she's an alumnus of our school. She's an inspirational speaker, a marvelous writer, and a keeper of the faith. It's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Barbara Brown Taylor. Oh, what fun. Please pray with me. Come Holy Ghost, our soul inspire, and lighten us with your celestial fire. For if you are with us, then nothing else matters. And if you are not with us, then nothing else matters. Be with us, we pray, in the name of your beloved. Amen. Amen. So, Dean Markham and Bishop Shand, distinguished faculty and staff, honorary degree candidates, including Harry Pritchett, my first boss who taught me everything I know, valued friends and family, and above all, the perhaps sleep-deprived but soon-to-be credentialed class of 2014. Grace to you and peace in the name of the one God who comes to us in more than one way. So what a lot of work and prayer. What a lot of expense. Only you know how much, but in a few moments, each of you will come up here to receive your diploma, most of you already wearing your new hood. And when you return to your seat, your life will have changed again. By the power vested in Virginia Seminary, you will come up here students and sit down masters and doctors and certified experts in your fields. <laughs> From now on, when you're in a meeting that's come to a standstill because no one knows what to do with everything that's on the table, people will turn to you and say, where are we going with this, Rev? What's the next step? Who, me? Yes, you. Or maybe you'll be sitting with two people who are hoping you will save their union by telling them who's right. <laughs> you'll do a great job of making sure they each have a chance to vent without interruption, but then at the end, they'll both look at you with, do you see what I mean? <laughs> On their faces while they wait for you to speak the truth. Who's right? Who's wrong? Where do we go from here? What's the next step? It's not as if you've never had authority before, but it's about to get worse. <laughs> Especially for those of you who are headed into parish ministry. People are going to be so happy to see you, especially if you're under 40. <laughs> because you're going to know how to attract young people. You're going to know how to revitalize worship. 
You're going to know how to preach the kinds of sermons that can both comfort and challenge people in under 12 minutes. <laughs> under your leadership, the church will thrive dodging the bullets of declining membership, aging physical plant, flagging budget, and worn out volunteers. You've chosen an interesting time to enter ministry <laughs> or to engage it more deeply, whether as a layperson or an ordained one. By some counts, 4,000 churches close every year, while others cut expenses any way they can. Bivocational ministry may become the norm before some of you have retired. And residential seminary education? We're all reinventing ourselves as fast as we can. God has not left every building, but God has left a lot of them. When I listen to congregations deal with that reality, I hear a lot of different coping mechanisms. One, it won't happen to us. Two, our job is to just keep doing what we do as well as we can. Three, the reason there aren't more people here is because fewer people are willing to commit to a faith that asks something of them. They want to invent their own spiritualities the way they invent their own cocktails. A jigger of this, a splash of that, something bracing to sip when they have time. I call this last one blaming the unchurched, and most unchurched people get it. If they don't feel blamed for being shallow, for being selfish, for being slackers who don't care if their children grow up with no values, then they at least feel judged by the faithful who want them to feel guiltier than they do about their absence from the tent of meeting. This isn't the wilderness, and none of us is Moses but I figure you can still get on board with the metaphor. There you are, deep in the wilderness you thought you'd be long out of by now. You've eaten so much manna for so long that your brains are addled. You can't remember the slavery part of Egypt anymore. All you can remember are the fish, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, all those food groups. Everything you needed to be a fully functional human being who went to bed satisfied at night. But now the first generation in the wilderness is beginning to die off, and it's time for the second generation to rise up. If there's still hope of reaching the promised land, the people who arrive there will not be the same people who first set out. They will be the children of those people, the grandchildren of those people, all of them raised on manna, with no memory of what came before except the memory you give them. Ah, if only we had meat to eat. It starts with some of the old timers who remember how much stronger they felt back when they had meat to eat. But before long, the complaint has become multi-generational, spreading through the camp so that even the young ones start crying when manna falls that night. That makes God mad. And God being mad makes Moses mad. He can't deal with these people any longer, he says. If God wants to breastfeed them, God can, but Moses is pulling his shirt down. <laughs> he didn't give birth to these people. He's not nursing them any longer. If God doesn't like it, God can kill him on the spot. <laughs> so you heard it. The Lord says to Moses, gather for me 70 of the elders of the people and officers over them and bring them to the tent of meeting and have them take their place with you. Then God explains the plan. Moses has so much spirit that he won't miss a little of it. So God's going to do some reapportionment. Once the 70 are in place at the tent, God's going to come down in a cloud and put some of Moses' spirit on them. Everyone who is there on time will get some. Then when the ceremony is over, Moses will have 70 spirit-filled elders to help him get the people where they're going. That's usually the point on occasions like these. Whatever you're setting out to do, don't try to do it alone. Even the most gifted leaders need help, which God will provide, at least if you're willing to sign up for the spirit-sharing plan. But since you already know that, I want to press the other point as well, that at least two unauthorized people are receiving their full dose of spirit from God 
right now. Though they've not learned what you have learned, and they certainly did not pay what you paid to learn it. They were registered, scripture says, but they didn't show up. They went AWOL, staying at the camp while everyone else went to the tent. And later, when a parishioner busted them for prophesying in the camp, instead of the tent, the associate rector backed him up. <laughs> Joshua went to straight to Moses, who was the authorized leader, and said, my Lord Moses, stop them. And Moses, the authorized leader, said, would that all the Lord's people were prophets. In days to come, you're probably going to hear a lot about people who don't show up at the tent when they're supposed to, or who don't show up at all anymore, and who make things worse by saying and doing some pretty inspirational things that no one authorized them to do. Some will use religious language that makes you shudder, while others don't use it at all. You'll hear some of them giving TED Talks on the radio, and you'll read about others getting arrested for protesting things worth protesting. Depending on where you live, you may pass some of them playing the violin on subway platforms or giving speeches to local school boards. You may even go to church one morning and see a sign advertising a poetry slam at the bookstore across the street that starts at the same time as your main worship service. The sign out front will say, looking for an alternative to the tent? There's no telling who your L dad and me dad will be, but if they get too close, or the crowds around them get too large, then you're bound to feel prickly about that at some point. Shouldn't someone call them out? Shouldn't someone go to all those people who think they're being fed and offer them a taste of something more substantial? Help them refine their tastes and go to the next level? Even if you talk yourself off that ledge, don't be surprised if one of your spirit-filled elders asks you to do something about the unauthorized prophets. It's happened before. If you can't shut them down, will you at least strengthen the faithful? Praise your congregation for being where God wants them to be. Rehearse their credentials. Tell them how much better off they are than the shallow people who snub the tent of meeting. I'm making all this up. <laughs> but if it does happen, maybe you too will use your authority to defend the unauthorized, reminding your Joshua that God has deregulated the spirit, not just once, but over and over again, accepting all the usual risks, more competition, less stability, lowered standards, fewer consumer protections, things the newer generation takes for granted while the old-timers miss their meat. Why should you do that? Because it's how you clear the way for all the Lord's prophets, all the Lord's people to become prophets, or at the very least, it's how you get on board with God's spirit-sharing plan, even if your own shares go down. I do truly believe that this is an exciting time to be in ministry. You're nodding at me, especially parish ministry, because God is doing a new thing and the Spirit is popping out all over the place, giving God's people a thousand chances to do what Harry talked about last night, to affirm and relax and rejoice in divine inventiveness, absolutely wherever it shows up, in the tent and in the camp among the faithful and among the nuns. There's never been a better time for exploration, innovation, collaboration, reinvention. There's never been a better time to remember why we're here, because self-preservation has never been a big enough mission for the church, never has been, never will be. Those who hunger for the good old days run the risk of treading on manna, without even seeing it, while those born in the wilderness cook up new dishes for their elders that the geezers never dreamed of. <laughs>
When Jesus was looking hungry and his disciples tried to get him to eat something, he said, I have food to eat that you do not know of, but you do know it because you have lived on it. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Class of 2014, may your appetite for that food grow along with your authority to commend it to others, and may it nourish your bodies and your souls all the days of your life. Amen. Amen.
That really was quite a remarkable anthem. Let's just show our appreciation to the choir. We are now at the point in the commencement where we award the prizes. And I wish to now invite my good friend and distinguished colleague, the Reverend Dr. Barney Hawkins, to give out the St. George's College Jerusalem Prize. The St. George's College Jerusalem Prize is awarded by the North American Committee of St. George's College Jerusalem to a graduating student who has shown an interest in the geography of faith, which is the Anglican Communion. In particular, the prize is awarded to the senior who seeks to understand the complexity of the Middle East, a student who appreciates the dynamics of religious pluralism and living with difference. After consultation with the faculty, this year's prize, a trip to the land of the Holy One and a course at St. George's College is given to Adrian Himes from the Diocese of Los Angeles. Thomas Underwood Dudley Award for Reading of Scripture and Liturgy, the Dudley Speech Prize, in memory of the Right Reverend Thomas Underwood Dudley, was established in 1981 to be awarded to the graduating student who, in the opinion of the faculty, has demonstrated excellence in the public reading of Scripture and interpretation of the Scriptures and the liturgy. This year's recipient has emerged as a quiet yet strong leader in this community she has helped the community embrace contemplative prayer practices and has been a model herself of a deep faith rooted in a disciplined rule of life centered in prayer. As a lay person, she's proved herself to be a true pastor to students and faculty, a person to whom others regularly turn for spiritual guidance and wisdom. Her reading for the Dudley Speech Prize exemplified these qualities, an ability to lead others into an experience of prayer and to present scripture in a way that draws deeply on her own faith and experience of God, while generously inviting others into this place of transforming encounter with the holy. The recipient for this year is Francie Thayer from the Diocese of East. <laughs> Every year, a Virginia seminary chair is presented to that member of the graduating class who has exhibited through the range of his or her overall contributions a strong commitment to the community life and mission of the seminary. The Ford chair is the generous gift of Susan Ford, a loyal supporter of the seminary. Our recipient came to the seminary with a long history of ministry with youth and in parish life generally. He possesses natural skills of leadership and service. When Hurricane Sandy struck, he organized relief supplies to our sister seminary, General Theological Seminary, in New York. In his time here, he has built on his love of learning, proving to be perhaps more able in Greek than he might have expected. <laughs> he is sound, measured, thoughtful, but also possesses a light, generous, and wicked sense of humor. He has been a means by which God has blessed this community, and we pray that he will be so for God's church. I'm pleased to present the Ford Chair to Dorian Del Priori from the Diocese of Upper South Carolina.
Harris Award was established in honor of the very Reverend Charles Upchurch Harris, a member of the class of 1938, and his wife. The Harris Award is given annually to a candidate for holy orders selected by the dean in consultation with the faculty who has best demonstrated academic excellence, leadership ability, and other qualities evidencing fitness for the ordained ministry. This year's recipient is a bright scholar, critical thinker, and persuasive writer. With academic excellence in all areas of study and ministry, she is particularly gifted in classic languages, Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, and is fluent in Spanish. In her gentle quietness, she is thoughtful, effective, and cheerful resource and support to her peers, well beloved for her outstanding work as a teaching assistant in two New Testament classes. She is a very good example of the learned clergy we aspire to nurture at Virginia Theological Seminary. We are happy to present this year's prize to Eileen O'Brien from the Diocese of Texas. my board chair to join me. On behalf of the faculty of Virginia Theological Seminary, I present to you the following members of the graduating class of 2014 who are candidates for the Certificate of Work Accomplished. Andrew Ryan Guffey. Thank you, Andrew. Andrew Joseph Hagee. John D. Willard V. Laura Beth Woods in absentia. And I think it's lovely when you clap those in absentia because they're almost certainly watching on the screen. So. Bishop Shand, I present to you the following members of the graduating class of 2014, who by their application and industry in the use of special talents, has earned the degree of Masters in Theological Studies, cum laude, Riley Keane Temple. <laughs> Whose honest thesis is entitled, Signposts, Remember Aunt Esther's Children, Their 20th Century Pilgrimage to Redemption to Singing. I will let you adjust my mic. Thank you, sir. Thank you. That's great. Bishop Shand, I present to you the following members of the graduating class of 2014 who are candidates for the degree of Master of Arts. Anita L. Braden. Sarah Engleby Farrell. Eric Lynn Henry, BA in absentia. <laughs> Emmanuel Godfrey Medinda. Hey. Mahela Beth Mitchell. <laughs> Aaron Taylor Monroney. Mary Carol Taswell. Yeah. 
Bishop Shand, I present to you the following members of the graduating class of 2014 who by their application and industry in the use of special talents have earned the degree of Master of Arts cum laude. Harvey E. Bale, Jr., whose <laughs> honest thesis is entitled Jesus Superiority, Syncrasis of the Son to the Angels and Moses in the Letter of Hebrews. Christine McFadden Crosby. Mary Hunter Rouse in absentia. Susan G. Severe, whose honest thesis is entitled Nurturing the Call of a Lifetime Towards a Culture of Learning in the Church. Francis Key Dobbin Thayer. <laughs> Bishop Shand, I present to you the following members of the graduating class of 2014 who are candidates for the degree of Master in Divinity and Licentiate in Theology. Melinda May Artman. John C. Benist. <laughs> Mignon Lawton Brokenborough. <laughs> Patrick Michael Bush. <laughs> Catherine Hahn Bird. Amber Brooke Carswell. <laughs> Jonathan Colton Chesney. <laughs> Victoria Helen Clayton. <laughs> Judith Webb Davis. Micah Dorian Del Priori. <laughs> Megan Elizabeth Demby. <laughs> Benjamin James Hart. <laughs> John Edwin Hogg. Nicholas Andrew Hull. Adrian Renita Himes. Kenneth Joseph Katona. Elizabeth Franklin Keeler. Stephen John King. We're just having a camera adjustment here. Perfect. Denise K. Kirkley Kane. Emily Anderson Lukanich. <laughs> Hester S. Mathis. <laughs> Edward Weston Matthews. Congratulations. 
Mary Alice Matheson. Caitlin Elise McAllister. Joshua Messick. Kristen Hassler Mills. Alexander Thomas Moreschi. And Francis Pierpoint. Dennis Joseph Reed. Amy Austin Slater. Daniel Joseph Shine Stroud. Mary Beatrice Sullivan. George Christopher Wong. Bishop Shand, I present to you the candidates for the degree of Masters in Divinity, who, through additional uh, effort and fortitude, have also earned the Certificate in Muslim Christian Studies through the Washington Theological Consortium. The certificates will be presented by Dr. Rich Jones, Consortium faculty member. Christopher Dutil Slane. Elizabeth Watt Tomlinson, whose honors thesis is entitled The Cross Inside the Crescent, The Place of Jesus in Islam. <laughs> Bishop Shand, I present to you the following members of the graduating class of 2014 who by their application and in industry in the use of special talents have earned the degree of Master in Divinity Cum Laude. John David Adams. <laughs> Sarah Margaret Colvin, whose honors thesis is entitled The Episcopal Church's Response to Gun Violence. Joshua Luke Hosler. <laughs> Eileen Elizabeth O'Brien, whose honors thesis is entitled, Through the Veil of His Flesh, Entering into the Relationship Between Liturgy and Apocalypse Through Hebrews. Sarah Elizabeth Sachs. Cameron Jane Solis. Bishop Shand, I present to you the following persons as candidate for the degree of Doctor of Ministry. Jack, I better wait for a moment. <laughs> Jack Hufford Albert Jr., whose project thesis is entitled Don't Lose Your Head While Leaders of Independent Episcopal Schools Leave and What Can Be Done to Keep Them.
John Floyd Beddingfield, whose project thesis is entitled Through a Glass Brightly, A Franciscan Way of Beauty into Action. Alison D. Byerly, whose project thesis is entitled, I Have Called You Friends. <laughs> Joel Gilbert Hafer, whose project thesis is entitled, The Communal Lament, Revisioning Life After Loss. David Andrew Madison, whose project thesis is entitled Ad Maiorum De Glorium, How Emotional Intelligence and Ignatian Spirituality Informs Leadership Training for Adolescents. Yeah. Frida Louise Malcolm, whose project thesis is entitled Connecting the Extreme Poor and the Financially Secure Through Plan Giving. Robert Emilio Moses, whose project thesis is entitled Storytelling as a Precursor to Evangelism, using biblical storytelling as a way of discovering, forming, and sharing personal story. <laughs> Ned Robert Murray, whose project thesis is entitled Hearing the Call, Adolescents Drawing Closer to God Through Creation. Lark Stevenson Diaz in Absentia, whose project thesis is entitled Teaching to Mystery, the Effect of Education on the Experience of Worship. <laughs> David Wayne Taylor, whose project thesis is entitled The Ministry of Hospitality, an Instrument for Curbing Student Attrition. James Edward Taylor, whose project thesis is entitled Transforming the Giver, Affecting Congregational Giving Patterns Through Faith, Gratitude, Formation, and Proclamation. <laughs> William Carl Thomas, whose project thesis is entitled Interpersonal Intelligence Mediated by Self-Reflective Adaptive Practices that Manage Anxiety, Lean, learning to lead by giving space. <laughs> Mauricio J. Wilson, whose project thesis is entitled The Elusiveness of Inclusiveness. Brian W. Winter, whose project thesis is entitled Bringing Faith into the Home. Bishop Shand, I present to you the following persons as candidates for the degree of Doctor of Ministry from the Washington Theological Union. Virginia Theological Seminary is pleased to be part of the ceremony at which these individuals will receive their diplomas. These graduates will be hooded by Dr. Kathy Brown. Michelle Skillless Ernest, whose project thesis is entitled Healing from the Inside Out, A Deeper Look at the Spirituality of Healing. Carol Ann Higgins, whose project thesis is entitled Walking and Talking with Holy Partners, an investigation into the use of narrative as a tool for spiritual formation. Yeah. 
Mary E. Miller in absentia, whose project thesis is entitled Pathways of Grace for God's Holy People. Catherine Quell Engel, whose project thesis is entitled Deep Abiding, Praying, Living and Loving from the Inside Out. <laughs> Kendrick Demond Weaver, whose project thesis is entitled Missing Links, Connecting Methodist to Discipline and Meditation. At this point, Chair, I invite Brent Francis Blackwelder to stand on the cross at the bottom of the stage. I present to you the following persons to receive the degree of Dr. Humane Letters, Honoris Causa, Brent Francis Blackwelder. Brent Blackwelder, as the son and grandson of Episcopal clergymen, you have been steeped in the knowledge and the earth that the earth and the Lord's is the Lord's and all that dwells therein. From this early awareness, you have gone on to draw some urgent conclusions about the future of our planet that have been timely and influential to policymakers in both government and business. Your reputation as one who is able to inform and influence is well deserved since you speak from a well-developed base of knowledge. After graduate study in mathematics at Yale, and while writing a doctoral dissertation on the rights of animals at the University of Maryland, you founded the Environmental Policy Institute in Washington. While there, you provided critical support to leaders like Moe and Stuart Udall, who were working to focus the regulatory powers of the United States government on reducing the excessive use of locks and dams on our waterways. This regulatory change was instrumental in restoring the degraded habitats of freshwater marine life. Your background also allowed you to introduce environmental expertise into the challenging conversation of protecting clean air and clean drinking water for human beings. However, you are not one to remain cloistered in your study, serving only as an advisor. Aware that public opinion must not only be informed, but also mobilized for the public good, you volunteered on the first Earth Day in 1970. For over four decades, you have actively lobbied Congress and regulatory agencies to prioritize, prioritize environmental concerns and directed campaigns aimed at firms in the manufacturing and financial sectors whose actions affect environmental and public health. You built up Friends of the Earth into a respected citizen voice. Through all these actions, you warned us that in the area of environmental protection, every victory is temporary, every defeat permanent. Along with your extraordinary dedication to the Earth, and its sustainability, you have also nurtured a wide-ranging web of relationships that are central to your life. These begin with your much-beloved extended family and encompass your neighbors in Cleveland Park, where both your summer evening softball games and glowing fireplace at your New Year's open house are legendary. These relationships, and no doubt your wholehearted love of the game of golf, have centered and sustained you through the years. For your lifelong witness to the joy of living among God's creatures, both great and small, Virginia Theological Seminary is pleased to confer on you the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, honoris causa. Thank you, sir. I think they want to...
quick picture, right here. Oh, we have a degree for you, too. I now invite Robertson Hershey to step forward. I present to you the following person to receive the degree of Dr. Humane Letters Honoris Causa, F. Robertson Hershey. F. Robertson Hershey, you have dedicated your life to education. With a bachelor's degree from Williams College and a master's degree from the University of Virginia, you were well credentialed to lead educational institutions when you began your independent school career at Woodbury Forest in 1970. There you first served as a history and economics teacher and varsity basketball coach. Over time at Woodbury, you went on to become the director of student life, director of admissions, assistant headmaster, and associate headmaster. Following your years at Woodbury Forest, you were appointed headmaster of Durham Academy in Durham, North Carolina in 1978. You subsequently served as headmaster of the prestigious collegiate school in Richmond, Virginia. After your time at collegiate, you were appointed headmaster of our neighbor, the Episcopal High School. At EHS, you not only serve as headmaster, but teach economics as well. You find great value in participating in students' educations by teaching and working with them, rather than by simply leading from an office. You constantly inspire the lives of the faculty and students around you. An Episcopal High alumnus said of you, Mr. Hershey is a hands-on headmaster. His dedication to the high school and passion for the community affects the atmosphere on campus and flows from him to the administration, faculty, and students. The relation between the seminary and the Episcopal High School has always been good, but under your leadership, the connection has grown especially strong. You were one of the first to visit the VTS campus when the chapel fire occurred, offering the resources of Episcopal High School to help us with our need for a worship space, an offer which this seminary continually is greatly appreciative of. A partnership agreement was signed, which led to the Episcopal High School faculty living in housing on the seminary campus and to the Episcopal High School's investment of a million dollars to enlarge and renovate the Butterfly House so that the children of the faculty at the Episcopal High School would have a premier early years learning experience. For over 40 years, you have shared your life with your wife Kathleen and your marriage has been blessed with children, Will, Kate, and Christopher, and four grandchildren. Your family have been a constant source of support during your long and distinguished career, career as an educator. For all you have done to lead and educate new generations of students, and for your continuing support for the work and mission of Virginia Theological Seminary, we are proud to confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Humane, Humane Letters, Honoris Causa. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good to see you. I invite J. Riley Lewis to step forward. Bishop Shand, I present to you the following person to receive the degree of Dr. Humane Letters Honoris Causa, 
J. Riley Lewis. J. Riley Lewis, who could have imagined when you began singing as a boy chorister at age eight at the Washington National Cathedral that you would go on to become a distinguished performing artist of international renown. You studied organ as a child under your mentor, Richard Wayne Dirksen, at the cathedral. After earning your master's and doctoral degrees from the Juilliard School, you returned home to, collect, to conduct the Cathedral Choral Society now for 28 seasons. A lifelong Episcopalian, you have directed the public praise of God at Clarendon United Methodist Church for over 40 years. At the same time, you have gained wide acclaim as an organ and harpsichord recitalist. In 1977, you founded the Washington Bach Consort, an esteemed orchestra and chorus which you continue to conduct each season in world-class performances of the music of J.S. Bach. You have also promoted appreciation of Bach through educational outreach programs in the public schools. Whether in school, concert hall, or church, people encounter the deep spirituality of your life through the sublime beauty of your music. As both keyboard artist and conductor, you have reached a worldwide audience through your critically acclaimed concerts and recordings. Your special charism for identifying and mentoring young performers is seen in the artistic elegance and acceptance that many of them have gone on to display in their own careers. Numerous awards and honors attest to your brilliant performances and their impact on the human heart. Throughout your life, you have ministered to three distinct audiences, believers, secular seekers for the divine, and music lovers desiring nurture of the spirit. You have the uncommon ability to reach all three audiences and you do so with insight and irrepressible enthusiasm with grace and consummate excellence. In celebration of your life and artistic contributions, the Virginia Theological Seminary is privileged to confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, honoris causa. Thank you, my friend. It's been a real pleasure just to be here. Margaret Farley, please step forward. Bishop Shand, I present to you the following person to receive the degree of Doctor in Divinity Honoris Causa, Margaret Farley. Margaret Farley, you are a Catholic in the full sense of the word. You have served the Church Universal and the Academy in your vocation as a Roman Catholic religious in the orders of the sister of Sisters of Mercy and as a leading Christian ethicist. You taught at Yale Divinity School from 1971 to 2007, were made the Gilbert L. Stark Professor of Christian Ethics in 1986, and were the first woman appointed to Yale's Divinity School's Board of Permanent Officers. You have served as past president of both the Society of Christian Ethics and the Catholic Theological Society of America, from which you received the John Courtney Murray Award for Excellence in Theology. Your work goes far beyond the academy, as you have served on numerous national ethics committees and are co-founder of the All African Conference, which brought together African women religious to respond to the pandemic of HIV AIDS in Africa. You are the recipient of 11 honorary degrees, 12 after today. <laughs> you have written extensively on topics such as medical ethics, 
social ethics, and feminist ethics. Your scholarly works, such as personal commitments and compassionate respect, combine psychological subtlety and moral seriousness, intellectual rigor, and accessibility to the non-specialist. Your volume on sexual ethics, Just Love, for which you won the 2008 Louisville Greyheimer Award in Religion, is a wonder of interdisciplinary, cross-cultural, ecumenical, and interreligious scholarship. You have not escaped criticism for your prophetic thinking on controversial moral issues. But your goal has always been to address ethical questions in ways that reflect a deep coherence with the central insights of Christian traditions, while also being sensitive to the realities of human experience. You inspire the esteem and devotion of your students, colleagues, and readers, because above all, they recognize that your work is not only scholarship, but ministry. It is the offering of compassionate respect among the moral complexities of human life and pastoral guidance for how we can exercise ethical discernment in ways that lead to greater justice and love. Because your life and work models the compassionate wisdom and integrity of this school, which we value mostly. In this Virginia Theological Seminary, we are proud to confer upon you, Margaret A. Farley, the degree of Doctor in Divinity Honoris Causa. This is yours, and I need a picture. Thank you very much. Okay. God bless you. Thank you. I now invite Harry H. Pritchett to step forward. Bishop Shand, I present to you the following person to receive the degree of Doctor in Divinity Honoris Causa, Harry H. Pritchett, Jr. Harry Pritchett, embedded in the early years of your life are important clues to your fo future vocation. Summers spent in the diocesan camp, a starring role as Joseph in the Christmas pageant, <laughs> with your wife, Allison, beside you as the Virgin Mary, <laughs> in which you would later describe as, in quotes, the worst Christmas pageant ever, <laughs> and a degree in English from the University of Alabama earned along with a Phi Beta Kappa key. Your life has been a love affair with the Episcopal Church, with Allison and your three children, with the people of God, and of course, with God. Blessed with a keen intellect, a lively curiosity, and a generous spirit, you have faithfully served congregations in Alabama, Atlanta, and New York. In a ministry spanning 50 years, you have repeatedly shown us what parish ministry can be at its best and what it should be. A son of the American South, born in the 1930s, you work tirelessly to break down the barriers that have long kept African American women and other minorities on the margins of society. At All Saints Church in downtown Atlanta, where the congregation grew fourfold during your 16 years as rector, your teaching and preaching inspired your congregation to connect the sacred texts of scripture with their daily lives calling them to reach out to the victims of HIV AIDS epidemic that was spreading throughout Atlanta and every other city and town in America. In 1996, you accepted a call to be the Dean of the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York, the largest Gothic cathedral in the world. Your tenure as Dean was marked by radical hospitality that welcomed all seekers 
and by your leadership in strengthening the physical, financial, and spiritual pillars of that great cathedral. As director of field education at Swanee, as pastoral associate to the dean of BTS, and throughout your parish ministries, you have been a trusted, trusted mentor and role model for many seminarians and newly ordained clergy, always leading by example, encouraging them to move beyond their comfort level as they hone their skills in teaching, preaching, and pastoral care. Along the way, you wrote a song book for children. The chorus of the title song goes like this. Surprise, surprise, God is a surprise. Before your very eyes, it's baffling to the wise. Open up your eyes and see. <laughs> For all that you have done <laughs> to help us see the God of script surprises at work in the world and in our lives, we are proud to confer upon you the degree of Doctor in Divinity, Honoris Causa. Thank you, my friend. These are yours. Let's take a look over there. Right here. Right. Got it? You can sing better than you can direct. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. Bishop Shan, that concludes the awarding of the degrees. Before I give the benediction, I would like to let our audience know, our congregation know, that the graduating class of 2014 have sometimes been referred to the wilderness class. When they came in in October, September of 2011, someone promised them that they would graduate from a new chapel. I don't know why that person ever said that. But they did celebrate the first Eucharist in that new chapel last Wednesday night. And I have to tell you, my friends, I have been the chair of this board for five years now, and being with them last Wednesday night with just the seniors and the dean, it was one of the most moving things I have ever done. From the old chapel, to the interim chapel, to the new building. The spirit was alive, there was joy, there was hope, and you people, you're the class that will be ones who will continue to be hopeful. You will bring, be joyous disciples of Christ, and Lord knows you are spirit-filled. Thank you. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.